Paul Fisk has a BS in physics from Elon College and an MS in geophysics from Boston College. He is the founder of NDT Corporation. Uh, we'll be speaking about the preservation of post-tensioned bridges. Good afternoon. Uh, our uh, presentation this afternoon is going to talk about the use of uh, non-destructive testing methods to, to look for voids and soft grout in uh, post-tensioning ducts. And then my co-presenter is going to talk about uh, methods to remediate post-tension ten tendons. This presentation on uh, the non-destructive testing, I'm going to talk about what, what the problems are, uh, methods to use for uh, testing internal and external uh, PT ducts, I'll talk about the process, the testing processes, the limitations, the accuracy, and then my co-presenter will talk about repair options, and then I'll talk about the, the use of non-destructive methods for uh, the quality assurance of the, of the repairs. You know, why are our PT ducts filled with grout? It's, it's to protect tendons from uh, uh, contaminants like chlorides, and uh, it's to passivate the, the tendons to, to prevent uh, uh, corrosion, and it's, it's for, for the bonding of the tending uh, uh, for structural loads. Some of the problems that occur is, is that uh, voids occur uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the grout and you get soft grout. The reason for voids are that uh, uh, you, you have uh, uh, bleed water that, that's left behind that uh, gets absorbed. Uh, in, improper uh, uh, venting during, during the construction process uh, grout uh, leaks or, or pump, pump air. Uh, soft grout occurs because they put excess water into the grout mix. Uh, there's poor mix designs and, and segregation. So uh, uh, these are all uh, the problems that occur within the, the, the grout within the, in the PT ducts. The non-destructive testing methods that we use, we test them on uh, internal ducts and external ducts on the left-hand side. Is, is testing on the web of a, of a box beam bridge. And then on the right-hand side, this picture is uh, uh, testing an external duct. But primarily the method is uh, impact echo. Uh, we use a, uh, a projectile energy source to, to generate a stress wave, and then a series of sensors that, that pick up the, um, the uh, uh, resonant frequency. Uh, mm -hmm. Essentially, with external ducts, where we put a sensor on one side, the energy source on the other side. Uh, when we impact it, it, it creates a, a, a signal that travels through the, through the duct, and it, it gets trapped in there and reverberates at a frequency that's equivalent to what the thickness of the, of the, of the duct is and the uh, velocity, average velocity of the material. On internal ducts, is we, uh, uh, you can calibrate the system. You can take a measurement off of the duct and then Oh, if you're making measurement over a full duct, is you're going to measure essentially the same impact echo frequency as where, where, where there was no duct. If you have a void and you impact on top of it, the signal takes the fastest travel path, which is around, around the void and back, and so uh, uh, you get a, a lower frequency. Uh, the velocity of concrete typically is around 13, 14,000 feet per second. The velocity in air is about 800 feet per second, so the fastest path is going to be around, around that void. Same thing in a PT duct is if, if you have a void uh, I mean in an in a, um, external tendon, if you have a void, uh, uh, the signal is, is either going to get broken up and you're going to have no arrival or, or you're going to have a slow arrival. This is just an example of some data that we collected on a, a external PT duct. It uh, was kind of a surprise to me that, that, that what, what we got for results. On the, on the right-hand side, this is a time domain data, and on the right-hand side, this is a, a, a frequency domain, domain data. Primarily, well, on, on this particular uh, uh, testing that we were doing, uh, we picked up three frequencies. We had a 15 kilohertz, which is this, this uh, series right here, a 20 kilohertz and a, a 25 kilohertz. I should explain a little bit. These are 10 records in a row. We took measurements on, on one foot intervals. And so uh, this is uh, 10 feet of data. Uh, uh, it's just a waterfall plot of the, of the results. Uh, what we're looking for, a calibration that we had done on a, on a, on a duct, is that a, a full duct that didn't have a problem was going to get a 20 kilohertz signal. In this particular case, uh, like we got two additional frequencies. We got a 15 and a 25 kilohertz. Mathematically, it turns out that the 15 kilohertz is a signal that's traveling around the outside of the, 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 the concrete within the, or the outside of the grout within inside of the duct, 
and then the uh, 25 kilohertz is inside of the uh, inside of the um, uh, PVC uh, liner. So uh, in this case, we had th three sets of data that was telling us that the grout was pretty good. Uh, when we test internal PT ducts, is uh, it's kind of a four-step process. Uh, we first we use ground penetrating radar to locate exactly where the duct is. We mark that on on the side of the uh, of the beam or on the uh, girder, and then we come back and we do our impact echo testing. Uh, typically, we do that on a one-foot interval with a, a array that's 18 inches long, so we get overlapping data. And then any anomalies that we find is we'll drill a hole in, uh, open it up, and then we'll put a borescope in and examine what we got. Again, this is a, a waterfall plot, and uh, uh, I think we got probably about 15 uh, feet of data here. On the left-hand side is uh, 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 the, this, this uh, resonant frequency is for a, a, a full duct, a duct that the grout is good. On the right-hand side, this is typically the, the uh, signature we're looking for, is in here, this is uh, uh, of the full thickness frequency. And then, as you can see, the, the frequency peaks become a lower frequency, and that is a, the typical uh, signature that we're looking for for, um, for a voided uh, uh, PT duct. And this is uh, when we uh, you know, uh, drill in and open up the hole, we put a borescope in, and this is some of the images that we can get. You can see the high resolution. You can, you can see each one of the strands. Uh, this allows us to, to determine how big the void is, is whether it's a partial, a partial thickness void or a full, full duct void. Uh, from the, the measurements we made, we can determine the length of the, the void, and then we can calculate a volume of material that might be necessary to repair that. The duct was only half filled. Uh, in this case, it was close to the, um, to the anchor head. The, the strands are separating. There was no, no grout in here. In this case, you can see that at one time there was grout in here, and uh, uh, it has uh, 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 settled away, but the, the tendons are still covered with grout. This is from a, a project that we detected soft grout. Uh, soft grout doesn't appear any different than voids, uh, and the only way that we can really determine whether we got soft grout is, is, is to drill in. In this particular case, it was pretty uh, uh, granular type uh, 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 grout. You can see in the spoon there, we could kind of spoon it out. And uh, uh, again, a, a condition that, that you don't want to have in your PT ducts. Unfortunately, you, you, you can't use this testing everywhere. Is there's limitations as to locations that, that, that you can collect and collect the data. Is uh, if you've got ducts that are, that are over diaphragms, the, the thickness of the, of the layer becomes so thick that, that, that the time for the signal to travel around the void is, is, is so small that you can't, you can't detect it from, from the, the reflection from the back side of the, the concrete. If you have uh, wearing surfaces, if you're testing on top of a deck and you're uh, testing on wearing surfaces, if you're going to asphalt uh, wearing surface or it's wearing surfaces debonded, is we aren't, we aren't going to get a good resonant frequency from that. Um, if you've got multiple ducts, you've got ducts over the top of ducts, is you, can, you can determine if you've got a void. Uh, unfortunately, you can't tell which duct it, it's in unless you, you drill into both of them. And then uh, if you have irregular surfaces, if you have surfaces that are, are, are tipping away uh, uh, and you, you just don't get a good uh, uh, clean reflection re resonant frequency from it. Just to illustrate some of these conditions, is these are uh, that are ducts are over, over a web wall and that thickness is too much for us to detect uh, where, where the voids might occur. Over here, you got ducts over ducts, you got ducts over ducts here. Uh, those are some of the places that, that, that uh, uh, we have, have, have some problems uh, evaluating uh, whether there's voiding or soft grout. The accuracy is, um, there, in the literature out there that says the impact echo testing is, is about 60% accurate. Uh, I, don't, I don't argue with the number 60%, but I think it's kind of taken out of context. When the data, indicates that the duct is full. Uh, I, virtually every case that we've ever drilled to confirm this, uh, we found ducts that are full. When the data says that the ducts have voids in it, in almost all the cases, we have, we have found either a void or soft grout. Uh, unfortunately, when you're collecting the data, there is, there's three, three categories. You got data that tells you that the duct is good. You got data that tells you that the duct is possibly voided. And then you have data, that, then you don't have any data. You don't get any resonant frequency at all. And in, in that case, uh, uh, it, about 60% of the time, it turns out that, that, that you have a void. 
uh, the, what, what causes that situation usually is that you have something in the, in the sidewall. You have some honeycombing or cracking in the sidewall that breaks up the signal, and so you don't really get any indication back as to, as to uh, 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 whether the duct is full or not. Um, another uh, uh, comment on, on testing on PT ducts is uh, it, it, in the literature there, there's been uh, uh, I guess conversations that, that this testing cannot be done on PVC ducts. Uh, we have numerous bridges that we have tested that have, uh, that have PVC ducts and, and we've had good results on those. Uh, matter of fact, recently we tested a bridge and uh, uh, the anomalies that we found were uh, where the uh, sections of PVC came together and was wrapped with Canusa wrap and that Canusa wrap was, was, was loosely wrapped on and it appeared as, as a void. So. Uh, uh, the, the, this, this testing can be, can be conducted on uh, uh, PVC uh, tendons. Paul talked about voids and finding physical defects inside the tendon assemblies. And I'm just going to show you a few slides to um, show you a little bit more about finding water or moisture inside the tendon assemblies. Okay, so this is just a schematic diagram showing uh, the setup that we would typically use to determine if you've got water. Uh, either free water or just a high humidity inside your tendon assembly. At some location in your tendon assembly you're going to make an opening which could be a physical excavation or it could be a drilled hole into the tendon assembly. At that location you're going to connect a supply of dry gas and typically a flow meter and at one location or possibly at two other locations in the tendon you will have a second port installed Again, it could just be a drilled hole um, or an excavation. And at that location, you're going to have a, a flow meter and essentially a moisture content meter. Um, let's go back here just for a I'll explain one more thing first and then I'll go here. So at this location, you're pushing in dry gas and that is pushing an air sample out at the test location. You take the data that you get at the test location, I'll show you in a second how you collect it, and then you plot it on essentially a chart of relative humidity versus temperature. And if the reading ends up above this line, you have a wet cable and you have more than enough free moisture there that corrosion rate will be high. The corrosion rate will not be limited by the amount of moisture in the assembly. If your reading is in between these two lines, you have enough moisture there for corrosion to, to occur but the corrosion rate is typically going to be limited by the amount of moisture that is present. And if your reading is down below this line here, uh, the, basically you don't have enough moisture for corrosion to occur. So this is a test that gives you a lot of really good data in terms of what your corrosion risk is, you know, if you have a void, for example. Um, this is a picture uh, just showing you how the testing is done in the field. You have a location where an excavation has been made into, this happens to be in a building, but these are grouted tendons in a, in a building. Um, and you've got a supply of dry gas, in this case nitrogen, connected, and you're pushing in the nitrogen at this location, and that is pushing an air sample out of the tendon at this location, which is then being measured in this instrument, and that reading is being recorded by the technician. And you can do that in as many locations as you like. In some cases, they will test every individual tendon. In other cases, you'll just do a sampling. And in most cases, you probably will start with a sampling. And if you have problem data, then you might expand the program to do more, uh, uh, do more test collection. Between what Paul talked about and this, uh, you know, you typically have either physical problems with, with the grout, i.e i.e. voids or soft grout. And then on top of that, you have a situation, it's either wet or not wet. And so depending on where you fall in this matrix, you're going to do either one of two things or possibly both things. Um, if you've got voids, you're, you may wish to fill the voids physically so that reestablishes bond of the tendon, for example, eliminates a place where water can collect in the tendon assembly. Um, that fixes the void problem, but it doesn't fix the fact that you've got defective grout in there, particularly at the interface between the two things, and for that you may do impregnation, uh, which we'll explain in a second. 
If you've got soft grout, uh, in most cases you probably have excess water in the tendon assembly. In some cases you'll actually have free water sitting in there. And in most cases I would recommend that the first thing you should do is dry the tendon out because the water in there is not doing you any good. Um, so normally with soft grout, the first step is to dry the tendon. And then after the drying is completed, you may then do impregnation, which is a, again as a corrosion mitigation uh, step. In terms of impregnation and drying, what we're using, we're actually, this is a cro basically an end view of a, a seven wire strand, just a normal PT strand. So this is either 0.5 inches across or 0.6, depending on the, on the structure. And in between the wires, you have these very small gaps, the interstitial space between the wires. We're using those interstitial spaces as a longitudinal capillary in order to pass air along the length of the tendon for drying or to pass a low viscosity liquid along the length of the tendon for the impregnation process. If you're doing drying, you're going to have a cap. You're going to basically pressurize the end. You're going to push dry air through the assembly and exhaust air with a higher moisture content from the other end. And over time, that will dry the grout inside the assembly. In the case of impregnation, again, you're going to put a cap on the end. You're going to fill it with this low viscosity liquid, and you're going to push that liquid through the tendon assembly. It's going to travel inside the strands along the length, and then once that's filled, it's going to soak in between the wires of the strand into the surrounding grout. And I think you'll see this more clearly in the project photos following. So this is uh, just a picture. This is a picture taken from a Florida DOT bridge in uh, Jacksonville, um, where they had defective grout. Uh, they had voids and soft grout, a limited amount of soft grout, and they mitigated that by removing the caps, uh, filling the voids with, uh, with grout, and, and then reinstalling the caps. Here's the line for the impregnation material. There's a valve here. That valve is opened. You fill the cap with this low viscosity liquid. It's under pressure. And then you go to the other end of the tendon where you've also removed the cap and cleaned the end of the strands. And you literally wait there for the material to um, seep through and it will start coming out here you can see it's coming out one strand down here. It's just starting to, and you can see it's just starting to come out here. But these other strands at the point when the photo was taken, clearly the material hasn't made it there yet. You continue to wait longer, and here's a, another picture, and you can see that the material is seeping out the end of all of the strands. You're going to continue pumping until you have all of the strands um, material present coming out of the end, far end of all of the strands, at which point you'll put the cap back on at that end, you'll fill it up, and you'll pressurize the whole system, uh, typically for 24 hours, and that's just to soak as much of that material into the grout as possible. Um, when that's completed, normally the caps are drained and the caps are just filled with grout at the end of the process. Um, those photos were from actually the first project that uh, Florida DOT did using this technique, and that was five years ago, I guess. And at that project, uh, they made 24 openings like this just to verify that the material had passed through and it was actually soaking, it was present. So here is a picture of the duct. They've cut a section out of the duct here, and you can see the grout. And this is one of the engineers that they had there. He's just got a hammer and a small chisel, and he's physically removing the grout from the exterior of the tendon assembly and uh, chipping down just till you get to the strands. And you can see that there's the impregnation material is clearly present in that uh, location. And they did that at 24 locations like this, and then they patched those areas back up. Um, here you see they remove the grout all the way around the periphery. Um, they did not remove any of the grout from between the strands because these are live strands, you know, they're under load. But they wanted to see that the material had got there uniformly. 
Um, just before I turn it over, I'm going to turn it back to Paul for just uh, comments on the QC testing. Um, we have a project going on right now with Florida DOT um, where it has soft grout and water in the tendons and they're doing drying first. Uh, that part is in process at the present time and then once the drying is finished they will follow up with the impregnation that you just saw in this other Jacksonville bridge. And just to follow up on the grouting is if uh, the volumes don't turn out to be a, a, exactly what, what they predict and they turned out to be a lot less with the uh, sonic ultrasonic impact echo testing is we can go back and find those areas that they missed and then uh, the area missed can be, can, can be re-grouted. It's just to kind of summarize with uh, uh, non-destructive testing, uh, we've got over 20 years of uh, PT duct testing. We've worked on... Uh, uh, segmental bridges cast in place and precast bridges. Testing confirms conditions and provides results to repair, uh, repair bid documents. Uh, uh, we can put, you know, uh, map out the locations uh, where the voids are, approximate vo uh, volume of the voids, bore scope data, look at how much corrosion there is, and, and make a judgment on the severity of it. Uh, grout and defect and corrosion can, uh, can, can be mitigated. So the question was about the liquid that we're injecting into the tendons and what is it. It's a silicon hydrocarbon polymer, if that helps you. People often ask, is it an epoxy or a urethane? It's not an epoxy or urethane. It's a single component material. And we specifically use a single component material because we don't want it to start curing or setting partway down while you're doing the, in basically the injection work. Is there any need to do the evaluation if you don't see any sign of deterioration or is that something we need to do as a routine inspection or what, what, what is your thought? Because you know, all the post tension they may have segregation, I'm assuming. The vast majority of projects that we have, that we've been involved in doing the repairs on, the problems weren't visible in any sense. I can only think of one job where they had a, they had a broken tendon and they, they did they end up doing more investigation because they had a broken tendon but on most if not all of the other ones I can think of right now there was no external visible sign that there was problems it was only because they did an inspection that they found whatever they found and in some cases they find nothing obviously but in cases where they do find a problem that's where you tend to get involved, but I can only think of one job that I've been involved in, certainly within the last five years, where there was no, um, where it was, they did the work because there was visual, physical, apparent damage. It's usually not the case. Uh, when it comes to checking for moisture, you're talking about putting in an inspection port and then blowing in your dry gas for nitrogen. Yeah. For that second, for that outlet where you're taking that measurement, is there a minimum distance? Um, I'll go ahead and answer that. Well, I don't think there's officially a minimum distance. I mean, obviously, you're only measuring um, what's between those two locations. Um, if you run the test long enough, uh, you will see the moisture content drop off if you start to get, for example, the nitrogen getting to your test location. So if your measuring locations are really close together, you don't have very much air in between there to test, particularly if you don't have voids. Um, I would typically go and test either end to end on a tendon if that was possible or from a midpoint to an end so you've got a good long length but if that's not possible because of access or other restrictions then just realize that that the amount of air that you have available to test is going to be more and more limited as you make that length shorter um, because you need a certain amount of of air sample in order to get a valid test um, that you're not just measuring the ambient air that's in the device to begin with and you don't want to push through a really small sample of air and then all of a sudden you're just measuring the moisture content of the nitrogen that you're pushing in but you can see that pretty clearly because the moisture content will drop down drastically um, if if you are actually pushing to the point that you're just getting the nitrogen out at the far end yeah. And that kind of led to the second question that, you know, if you're in a repair process and you're looking at the, you know, impregnation and you don't have access to the ends, yeah. can you still do that uh, impregnation, you know, from the side and yeah. then again with an outlet? Yeah, right so front. I showed an example where it was from the end and if the ends are accessible, that's by far the easiest way to do it. 
Um, the project that I mentioned that's going on right now, the ends of the tendons are completely inaccessible, uh, the way the bridge was constructed. So they are doing access ports from the side of the tendon, um, and, uh, and the work is being done that way. So yeah, it can be done that way. It's a little bit more work because it does involve chipping into the side of the beam or the girder or whatever to get to the tendons, which if you have the ends readily available, obviously it's, a it's much simpler just to go and remove the end cap, for example. Yeah, so, no, thank you. Uh, you showed a graph or a chart of the moisture content versus yeah. corrosion risk. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of any resources on if you are in a wet environment or the medium, how long it takes or what's the corrosion rate in mills per year or, or whatnot? Uh, yeah, I could, get, I could get you that information because that chart is based on uh, the corrosion rate of steel in uh, various humidity environments. Um, but it's, it's, it would apply to where you've got steel in voids or where you've got the interstitial space, like the internal surfaces of the strand. That, that chart would not apply to the portions of the strand that are, in, that are well grouted or in contact with alkaline grout. So uh, um, you could have a wet or a relatively wet situation and if it's fully, fully, fully grouted and you've got high alkaline, con you know, essentially concrete or whatever, you're not gonna have a corrosion problem. But that chart is based on testing exactly what you're, I'd be happy to share that with you. Just come and see me after, at the end of the session. I'll, I'll send you a link. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.